Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Jessica Hay, and I'm the creative director for Cannabis Growth, and we are a cannabis company. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to everyone that's here today. This is super exciting, and this is also one of the reasons why I felt doing this was important, um, because we need to start talking about this conversation in this new industry that's emerging. So <clears throat> before getting into it, I just want to tell you a little bit about my, <clears throat> my history and, and how I got to where I am today. Um, I didn't apply to Canopy as a creative director. This has been about five and a half years of evolution. <clears throat> so I started in the industry in 2014 and uh, I was just out of school. I went to Algonquin College for graphic design and um, I started a, in my internship <clears throat> underneath an illustrator. And this company, Tweed Inc. at that time, was opening up in Smith Falls and I needed a job and they were looking for a front end web developer. So I felt fairly comfortable with my coding and my knowledge and I applied for it and I did a couple tests and got the job. And I'll be honest with you, I barely knew what I was doing. Uh, I worked my, my butt off uh, when I was given a challenge. I, did, I researched the hell out of it and um, I basically just I figured it out. So since my my career at this company. I started as a front-end web developer. I then moved into a designer role. I was then a senior designer. I was then an art director. Then I became a associate creative director, a creative lead, and finally for the last year I've been the creative director. So to get ourselves a little familiar with this topic, and this is mostly for all the, the red and the yellow uh, dots that are out there today, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of cannabis knowledge and probably you'll be familiar with some of these, these terms and this terminology um, and you might not as well. So you'll see throughout this, this presentation uh, the word or the abbreviation LP and LP basically stands for licensed producer. So within Canada in order to legally sell and grow cannabis you have to be given a license by Health Canada to do this and that's what makes us a licensed producer. Um, a few other terms that I'm sure you've heard of are THC and CBD. So THC and CBD within cannabis um, are cannabinoids. Within one plant, there is about 150 different cannabinoids. And THC, are just, THC and CBD are just two of the more well-known and also more studied. Um, so you will know THC as, if you've ever consumed cannabis, you will know it as the high. It's actually the psychoactive component or cannabinoid within cannabis. And CBD is actually quite the opposite. There is absolutely no psychoactive effects of CBD. Um, most people that consume CBD are looking for uh, pain management solutions. And then two other words, um, indica and sativa. So indica, um, <coughs> I guess over the years there's been there's been a lot of crossbreeding. So as we know, cannabis has, cannabis has been around for generations, and there are two strains essentially. And indica is said to be the strain that most people will consume for evening or uh, nighttime relief. So it's very sedative. And then sativa is actually the opposite. So a lot of people will consume sativa for uh, daytime or um, for morning relief. To kickstart your day basically. So I'm just going to tell you a really quick history about, about cannabis. <clears throat> in 1923 cannabis was criminalized so it was uh, banned and it was deemed as a narcotic and it was added to the same act as other drugs such as um, morphine, uh, cocaine, codeine, and then in 1992, the endocannabinoid system was discovered. And I'm including this because it is a really important discovery um, for two reasons. First, um, it's, it's very new. So we don't know much about the endocannabinoid system, but we all know that it lives within us and it lives within every single animal. And secondly, this is really the time that a revolution started, that doctors and researchers started looking at cannabis as a viable form of medicine and treatment. Coming out of that, in 2001, the MMAR comes into effect, and uh, that allows patients that are consuming cannabis uh, to, um, to either purchase it from a legal licensed producer or to grow it themselves. 
Then we move into 2013, where the MMPR comes into effect. 2016, the ACMPR comes into effect. And keep in mind, with every new act that's in place, there's a whole new set of regulations. And then finally, October 17, 2018. And this was the day that cannabis prohibition ended. Um, this is our new beginning. And um, this is why we're all here. So to give you a overview of how quickly things actually do change, um, March 2014, this is the year that I started in this industry, there were 35 employees. I was number 35. There, we were in one country, which was Canada. There was a handful of licensed producers. So at this time, probably about eight to 10 across Canada. There were two creatives. And we were a medical only landscape, which means that in order to consume cannabis or to have cannabis legally, you had to have a prescription from a licensed practitioner. And fast forward five years to July 2019 today, we are 3,800 plus employees, and that is globally. We are onboarding 30 to 50 people a week. We are in 12 countries across five continents. There's 150 plus licensed producers across Canada. And the creative team is actually split up into two teams. So we now have a creative department, which houses uh, 45 creatives, and that's art directors, designers, writers, um, project managers, video team, um, and now we also have a 70 plus marketing team. And we are a medical and recreational company as well. Um, <clears throat> And it doesn't actually just stop at medical and recreational. We are now looking at other landscapes to expand into, such as veterinary care. Um, what does medical CBD look like for uh, your companion animals? Um, <clears throat> cosmetics, uh, health and wellness. So effectively at this stage, we are the largest licensed producer, legal licensed producer in the world. And at that stage, what comes next? So just by a quick show of hands, who here thinks that um, it is legal within Canada to purchase uh, or to sell a chewable such as a gummy? Smart. Um, and what about a concentrate such as a vape pen? So you are all correct, very good job. <laughs> Um, so there are only three formats that we are allowed to sell legally in Canada right now. Uh, first is whole flower canvas, um, and you can mill that or you can sell it by whole flower. Um, oil, which has to have a dilutant uh, mixed with a dilutant, which can be uh, MCT oil or coconut oil. And finally, um, soft gels. In December 2019, there's a whole new set of regulations coming into play, and Health Canada is going to allow licensed producers to develop and sell um, products such as infused beverages, um, infused chocolates, gummies, concentrates, vape pens. So this really means a whole new set of regulations. It means a whole new set of brands of new products and new growth for this industry. So as you can imagine, within five years. Um, I just love this photo because <laughs> this dog is not high, but he is our office dog. <laughs> um, so as you can imagine, within five years um, and that rapid and quick growth, they're going to have, there's going to be some challenges. Regulations. I'm sure most of us are wondering about the regulations. So <clears throat> when I so how do you basically advertise for a company when legally you're not allowed to? Um, and how do you talk about a product when uh, everything is so restricted? So when I first started in this industry, um, the, re the regulations were really loose. We were allowed to do, uh, we could uh, have photos of our grow rooms on our website. Uh, we could have product photography. All didn't have to be behind an H gate. Um, we were allowed to capture and post um, testimonials, so people's effects and when they consume cannabis. 
um, we were allowed to talk about the independent sativa ratios. And we were even allowed to say we've studied and, and people have said that this strain in particular has been really good for um, increasing your appetite or this strain has been really good for um, um, helping with sleep. So now under today's regulations, all of that is non-compliant. Um, <clears throat> We have a whole process in place within our company, and we're actually quite lucky that we can work with and very closely with our legal team. So probably most people don't have to go through this process in their day-to-day -day lives, but um, before that, we before we get a brief, a brief is always approved by our legal team. And once we create the work, before it actually gets approved, we need sign-off by our legal team. Um, <clears throat> and it's important to note that the licensed producers and ourselves, we're not the ones setting the regulations. All the regulations come from Health Canada, and we're obligated to follow them. Um, but if we follow them too closely, it will never allow for progress. So our challenge is to continually find what the loopholes are. Um, there's a lot of black and white across the regulations. They do state you know, what you can, can do, what you absolutely cannot do, but there's a really big gray area in there too. And the gray area is what we all have to interpret. And uh, we need to find what those loopholes are. So for example, um, within the regulations, it states that we are not allowed to show people in cannabis um, because they deem it as promotional. Um, but what we can do is show people in their working environment. So if we were to have, just so happen, a uh, facility grower, that is in a grow room talking about their job, that's actually legal and it's compliant. Um, except for Alberta. Alberta. Alberta's not really happy with that. So <laughs> we recently had our videos uh, taken down uh, in one of our Cineplex theaters and uh, because their interpretation of the regulations are different. So you can imagine that there's a lot of, you know, um, different points of view on how we interpret those regulations. Uh, stigma. So, <clears throat> how do you break down 95 years of stigma associations and stereotypes? One of my favorite things to do in this company and in this industry is to visit our facilities as regularly as possible. And I don't have as much time to do this as much as I would like to, but um, whenever I do, I always have a new appreciation for the growth and what we are doing. Um, I try and get every opportunity that I possibly can to bring in uh, new partners or um, uh, new employees and tour them through our facilities because the end result is always the same. They come in with this idea and this perception of what they think they're walking into. And then they enter our facilities and they go through our processes and they see the scale and they see the production and they see um, the security measures it is never, they walk away always completely in awe because it is absolutely not anything that they ever expected. So I find speaking at events like I am today, um, talking openly about the topic and, and the product and uneducating people. I like to use that word uneducating because through 95 years of, of prohibition, um, there's a lot of associations that have been made with, with cannabis and the product and a lot of those are false. Um, <clears throat> with new study and uh, new data that we're gathering, it's really important to educate people and to give them the right resources so that they can be fed the right amount of information. Um, there's no path to success, um, or at least it's not clear, and I have no idea what it is. <laughs> so. But I look at this as a big opportunity um, for anyone working within the cannabis industry because we have, a, we have an opportunity to set new standards. And um, nobody gets this ever in their lifetime. So for things like, like culture, um, how do we want to define culture within, uh, within our teams and within our, our companies? Um, <clears throat> for things like, for me in particular, our agency, our internal agency, how do we want the internal agency to function? Um, what ownership do we get to have over the brands that we create? Um, what are our relationships like with external partners and our external agencies, and what are they not like? Um, and social impact. 
what do we want our companies and, uh, and our teams, and how do we want them to live within our communities? So I can look at this, I don't have a guidebook, but um, I can really look at this as, as a big opportunity. And um, uh, so this can be a really late, liberating thing, but there's also, um, it's a terrifying paradox because ultimately, we and myself, I have nothing to break, but then also everything to break at the same time. And somebody had recently just said to me that we can avoid the mistakes of our past, but the problems of our future of, of, are of our making. And in 20 years from now, when this industry is more developed, um, I would really like to look back and say that I set a new standard for how things, how those things have developed. I would hate to look back and say that I got this up and other people are making up for it and I had the opportunity at that point in my life to make it better. So if anyone happens to find themselves in the fast-paced industry or if uh, they happen to find themselves in the cannabis industry, um, these are some of my lessons learned uh, in my career. Fail fast and embrace the fuck ups. So, <clears throat> there's two parts here. Fail fast, you actually don't have a choice here. Um, because if you don't, you won't make it and you won't survive in this industry. We are constantly, constantly evolving and constantly pivoting. And the reason for that is as people become more comfortable with the subject matter and the product, our consumers are always changing, and we're discovering who our consumers are daily. And as the data and the science continues to evolve, um, so do the regulations, and that's within Canada, but then also all the other 12 countries around the world. So you have to continually learn, and you have to continually pivot. And one thing that I like to say often, and to my team too, is we are literally building the plane as we are flying it. So you are going to make mistakes. And so long as you are accepting of that, and um, <clears throat> so long as you're accepting of that, and so long as you take ownership of it, and that you learn from each time and apply it to your next iteration, you're gonna be fine. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, uh, I'd love to do, or not, I'll pause it all. I'm gonna do that. <laughs> So I have a couple of examples here, actually. So one of the most recent is uh, October 17th. So our company needs to go, well, what we want to do is go to market with a, uh, a value product. And um, we didn't anticipate how strict the regulations were going to be, especially for packaging. And when the regulations came out, um, Health Canada had stated such things like, um, you could only have two brand pieces on your packaging. One has to be your logo, uh, and the other has to be, well, probably your product name, because you want to know, people want to know what the product is. Um, <coughs> colors, they were really restricting on colors, so no fluorescence, no metallics. You also couldn't have any finishes, so those self-touch finishes, absolutely not. Uh, you have no, um, no semi-glosses or high-gloss additives to your, to your packaging. So we thought we were going to be a little bit clever about this, and what we did, was release a product called Plain Packaging, and we just completely called out the Health Canada regulations. So we thought it was funny, um, and <laughs> and with that, uh, we decided to have 12 iterations of, uh, of taglines. And the taglines would essentially be, it's what's inside that counts. Um, so the, the branding was super simple, um, super compliant, but we spent a Wrap ton of time trying to figure out how we're going to make this work. Um, so we had to trademark all the names because again, you're only allowed one logo per pack, um, one logo on your on your package. Um, so those taglines and that logo lockup had to be the logo, which meant we had to trademark 12 versions of it. Um, we had to make sure that that entire logo was the same size, if not smaller, than the THC stop sign that we're all familiar with. Um, and we went to market with it. October 17th, we went to market with it. And nobody got it. Um, it <laughs> felt completely flat. And the reason is, nobody else gives a shit about the regulations but us. We're the only ones that were reading them, we were the only ones that understood them. 
um, and the consumer didn't. So what we ended up doing was um, we, we didn't pull it off the shelves right away, but we came up with a new concept um, and launched with that, and now that's starting to roll out into markets. So a lot of time, a lot of energy, but again, lessons learned, um, and we can't always be looking on the inside of the company. We have, we have to know more about what the consumer's looking at, too. Letting go to appreciate scale. So, if you've ever worked for, or worked on a project, or worked in an agency, I'm sure you have gotten a brief. You've put countless hours into that project, put a ton of time into it, um, and then the project's done and you need to hand it over. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, we made an executive decision early, early on, um, to hire creative first. So creative was essentially going to strategize, we were going to build the brand, we were going to execute the brand, we were going to design the brand, and essentially we were going to own the entire brand long before anyone from marketing came along. Um, and the discovery of that was that it doesn't scale. Um, I kept that brand really close to me. And as we started growing as a company and we started growing um, across globally, um, we need to figure out how that was going to scale. And that meant me hiring the right people and transferring my knowledge of those brands um, to them to effectively allow them to scale the brand. And while I could look at how that was built, built globally and then scaling the team as well. Don't be afraid to do something new. So I can't tell you how many people come into this company and they come from pharma or they come alcohol, they come from some other big industry that has been around for generations. And they think that they can take everything that they've learned in their past and they can apply it here and they think it's going to work. And one, it, does, it doesn't always work because we are completely different. It's a totally different industry. And second, why would you want to do that? We have this amazing opportunity that we can take our learnings from our past, the best things from our past. We can filter out all the crappy things, and we can continue to make those better. Um, so this is the opportunity within this industry that you get to do that. And for us not to take advantage of it is, is just foolish, in my opinion. And know your craft. So <clears throat> my job is a lot bigger than my job description. Uh, creative director is just a really small portion of the things that I do and the things that I know within the company. And it is really important for me to know my job well, but at the same time, it's really important for you to know your product well and know the industry well. So I always encourage my team pretty regularly, um, they can all attest to this, like they're all pretty much here, um, that I encourage them to go to Smith's Falls and to our headquarters at least once a month because they should know what is going on in the facility because it's changing so quickly. I encourage them to talk to the scientists, talk to, we have some of the most some of the most brightest and smartest scientists in the world that work at our company, and they're discovering new things regularly. So talk to them and find out what they're working on. Um, talk to our production growers. Maybe they're testing some new types of soils, or you know, finding out what's working and what isn't working for them. Um, talk to our legal team. How are the, the rules and regulations developing? What are the laws doing, and, and how is that being applied locally? Um, all this stuff can just be applied back to your craft at the end of the day, and makes for a better product in the end. and believe in it. So I'm a big believer that our time is way too short and way too important to invest in something that we don't believe in. Um, I, I know for myself that I, I'm more knowledgeable about something and I have an easier time talking about it if I'm passionate about it. And I truly do believe in hiring people that, um, that feel that what we are doing is something to believe in because as a result, we are more effective uh, in breaking down stigma um, and in educating people and creating great things in, at the end of the day. Um, what's special about our, our industry right now is that, are, are the values that we put into hiring. And it's really important for us, and I think this can apply to anyone within, within the company, um, <clears throat> within their careers that um, you need to hire people that 
are believing that what they're doing is actually changing the world. But so what? So all the stuff that I've talked about. Um, so what is the... Is this moving? No, it's not. Sorry. There's a nice little animation here and it stopped working. Um, but so what? So 10 years ago, I if somebody would have asked me if I would have been leading the creative for a $20 billion company, I would have said there's absolutely no way. It's never going to happen. Um, but I think that the important thing here is that all these lessons and all these takeaways can apply to anybody, um, and no matter what industry that you're in. And another takeaway is that if you are feeling that you're at a bit of a standstill in your career right now, there's a whole category out there where you can take your learnings and your knowledge and apply to something and actually make an impact. Oh, it is moving now. <laughs> Give a second, and there's some nice smoke. Oh. <laughs> about this a little bit, but with the regulations placed on marketing uh, cannabis, do you 
find that it creates a block when marketing, or do you think it, the regulations make you push your limits and be more creative when marketing it? Um, I think the latter, for sure. Um, I think it pushes us to be more creative. Um, like they've really given us a box, and it's our job to think outside the box, and we just need to be more strategic. So I just look at it as, as an interesting challenge more than anything else. Of course, I wish they were much more loose and we could do whatever we want, but um, I think there's better work that actually comes out of it at the end of the day. Uh, I guess this is kind of additional to the last question, but uh, with the regulations being looser, primarily in the United States, um, how do you think their ability to market and maybe use influencers and stuff like that uh, might influence the Canadian market and how we kind of take creative approaches to that? So, that's interesting because uh, federally cannabis in the U.S. is illegal. Um, it's only certain states that are legalized. and. Um, now recently, like the Farm Bill has passed, um, they're talking about potentially federally legalizing cannabis across the U.S. I think it's going to be the other way around. Right now what's happening is uh, globally and why so many um, countries are starting to look at cannabis first as a medical treatment and a medical opportunity. Um, they're looking to us and how we have implemented our regulations. So I actually think it's going to be the other way around. I don't think um, they are going to, we're going to be influenced by them. I think they're Morning. You mentioned briefly about social impact. I'm wondering what it looks like in this emerging space and how to get it uh, rolling. Yeah. So um, we have. So I don't know if anyone kind of knows the story of um, Smith Falls and what had happened there or not. So I'll tell you a little bit about that because that is one of our, our values within the company um, and focusing on community. So Smith Falls.
having um, regulations in place has made the community uh, uh, safer for uh, attaining cannabis. And also, I don't know if anyone's been to the States, and if anyone has bought the gum over there, but um, usually those gums are about 50 grams of THC. Um, people don't know that. They're a tiny little like teddy bear gummy, and you take 50 grams, and that is first and foremost why most people have bad first experiences. So we're looking at uh, things like microdosing and experimenting with onsets and offsets. And once all that data, that data is gathered and proven, um, we can publicly communicate that. So we just need to make sure we're giving them the right print materials and the right tools, um, and guiding them on a safe experience and not something that's going to Hi. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, cannabis in the workspace, uh, just especially since you guys? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's evolving and it's changing. To be honest, we can't find enough space right now for our company and the growth that's happening. So I hope, and I mean, the goal in the long term is once things have started to probably settle a little bit, we can really start investing in you know what our our workspace culture is like. Um, but for me, and when I hire my team, I'm, I want to make sure that they are super collaborative and that they really like working with each other and that they feed off each other to create better work. Um, and I think every other department is very similar to that. So I think we do have a great internal culture. And I think this whole industry, honestly, has a really great internal culture. Um, but right now, it, it does feel very corporate because I think, actually, our department has moved. Uh, we're moving again into a um, six times in in three years. So because we keep up growing our space. Um, so right now it's really about the people. Um, you're not going to like come into probably most of these companies right now that are as large as we are and see you know, those um, really trending kind of like Shopify um, workspaces. But we're moving in that direction. Yeah, so definitely we will have those. I can't tell you what they are. Um, 